My name is Dave Arnold, as these guys mentioned. I am the founder, um, president, CEO, uh, head designer, head illustrator, um, custodian, uh, accountant. I have a couple different titles, but I work at a company called Mr. Sign, and I am, surprisingly, the only guy who works there. So, a lot of those, a lot of those titles lose a bit of their gusto, knowing that I'm the only guy working there. Um, I never set out to be a sign painter. It was sort of a, well, it was it was an unexpected uh, turn of events in the end. I started out um, in my youth as a relatively creative guy, growing up in a creative household. My parents were always encouraging me and my siblings to do um, something creative rather than watching TV, rather than and playing video games. Uh, we were always encouraged to either draw something or make something or read something. Those were the three. And obviously, as a kid, you don't want to do any of those things. You're like, <laughs> God damn it, I just want to play some video games. <laughs> but it was, in the end, it turned out to be quite beneficial. Um, in I, by the time I, I got to uh, high school, I was quite good at getting ideas down on paper. Just visually, anything that popped into my head, I could, I could draw a relatively good impression of what I was thinking of. And at the time, the things I was, I was thinking of were usually uh, <laughs> disgusting or rude <laughs> or completely inappropriate. So safe to say I didn't do so hot in high school. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> High school was not my strong suit. But um, after, after leaving high school, um, I didn't do anything artistic or anything visually artistic for quite a few years. I was working for a little bit of time as a, as a carpenter's assistant. I was working, doing just sort of odd jobs. I did a little bit of traveling. I didn't really touch anything artistic for quite a while. And then I ended up visiting Montreal. I grew up in Oakville, Ontario, and I, I got the hell out of there as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I went to Montreal, um, we went for a weekend, me and a bunch of buddies, and as soon as we went there, it, I got a very, uh, it was just a nice vibe there. As far as a, a guy who had artistic thoughts but wasn't uh, doing anything artistic with these thoughts, the place Montreal felt like a very good spot to sort of get some ideas going. So me and a bunch of buddies uh, loaded all our shit in a U-Haul and drove to Montreal and lived in a, a weird little hole in the wall for <laughs> years and years. <laughs> but uh, that was sort of an interesting turning point that uh, once I got to Montreal, the, it was uh, sort of the, the start of a lot of the stuff I'm doing, doing now. Um, the first winter living there was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare, because obviously none of us had any portfolios, none of us had any uh, experience in what we were trying to do. So the first winter there, we were trying to sell anything we could. So I was trying to sell illustrations to bands as t-shirt designs. I was trying to sell anything I possibly could artistically. I made a, a comic book that I tried to sell to little bookstores. Every single project the first winter was a absolute and utter failure, but nothing, nothing happened. Every single meal was a hot dog on a piece of bread with a piece of processed cheese. And not only was I only eating that, all of the roommates I was living with were also eating that. And you can imagine what the bathroom smelled like. The joke, the, actually in that era, the ongoing joke was just the term burnt plastic. <laughs> For some reason, that was, it, sum, it sums up that era. Just, well, we'll leave it at that. Um, 
After that first winter, I got an offer from um, some <laughs> friends of mine who were in a band who said, we need a guy to come on the road and sell t-shirts, like a merch guy. So I jumped very quickly at the opportunity to get the hell out of burnt plastic zone <laughs> and go a place that I could sleep in warm beds and at least eat three meals a day. So I went out and started selling t-shirts for this band and that was also a strange turning point as far as what I'm up to now, that it introduced me to the world of um, visual merchandising that when in that situation as a merch guy that you're, you're in a field with a hundred tents in the field and there's nothing to distinguish any tent from the other really. Everyone's trying to sell t-shirts, maybe a poster and a belt buckle, but everyone has essentially the same product and the only thing you can do to get people to come to your tent to buy those things is do something to make the tent more interesting. So I, I had a lot of fun in that era making not not signs, not like the stuff I'm doing now, but weird weird visual stuff and dressing strangely and just doing a bunch of weird <laughs> shit that, so that when people are walking down a row of tents, they say, well, this, this tent looks interesting. And <laughs> <laughs> I won't give you any other details. It, sometimes it got quite bizarre, but the, that was the sort of interesting part of that job was saying, how do we draw customers to this, this location? So that was uh, sort of the beginning of of that piece of my brain getting activated. Um, after that, I did that for about three years and every single night during those three years was an absolute shit show, freak out party. Because every time you go, every time you go to a town, it's their big night. So you go to Ottawa and it's Ottawa's, it, they've been waiting for this concert to show up for months. They're like, yes, party, party, party. Then you go to Toronto the next night, but they've been waiting for the concert to show up for three months. So for three years, every night was a freak out. So after three years, I said, I can't, my liver can't handle this. So I stopped doing that and went back to Montreal. I'd been sort of, all my stuff was there, my bed was there, but I didn't spend much time there for a long time. So I went back to Montreal with the intention to get something going. Um, I ended up s slipping into uh, American Apparel briefly for about a year, hired as a guy to do graphics, but it ended up being a guy basically patching holes in the wall. So I said, okay, this is not uh, too good. Switched to, um, switched to Urban Outfitters. I, I sort of did a very creative uh, cover letter, sort of describing the merch guy stuff, but not using the term merch guy. Be like, oh, I've always had a love for visual merchandising, and I love the idea of bringing customers in. And they bought it, hired me. And that job was actually very cool that uh, I was a display artist there, so I'm building fixtures and things and the, the you you would get bonuses if your if the thing you designed sold a bunch of products which brought that same piece of my brain into it I was like holy fuck if you make <laughs> if you make something that's really cool that draws a person to it then sales go up and um, and then you get an actual monetary bonus as a, as a result of that so that was a very attractive thing in the end, it turned out that my boss was taking credit for a lot of the stuff I was designing. So that job also ended in a blaze of glory. I said. <laughs> <laughs> so I quit, I quit that job. And for, for about one day, I was, so, I was on top of the world. I was like, oh, this is the absolute greatest. I basically told them to shove it, and that's that. So for one day, I was just living the dream, and then the next day, it was a real major oh shit morning where I was like, oh, what? I have no way to pay my bills this month. I'm like, shit! And that was, a, that was basically the unintentional start of what I'm doing now. Um, the original setup was doing, the original idea, when I woke up that morning, I was like, I am really screwed. Um, the original idea, it was October of whatever year it was, and the idea was to sell uh, Santa paintings, like like window, you know, you see at a supermarket, like seasonal paintings at Christmas time. The idea was to sell those to everybody up and down my street. So I made up this cornball flyer that said Dave's seasonal paintings or whatever it was, and started going door to door and saying, 
to whoever I, I bumped into, I said, could I speak to the manager? And they, most people's faces said, who the, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> and the manager would come and I'd say, hello, I'm Dave, and I'm selling seasonal window paintings. <laughs> and if you would like a Santa or perhaps a reindeer, then I am the guy to talk to. Most people obviously say, get the hell out of my store. The odd person, though, said, yeah, that actually is kind of a good idea. And I was getting paid peanuts. I did a couple of Santa paintings. And usually, I would start the price at, say, 50 bucks for a Santa on the window. And people would say, I'm not paying 50 bucks for a temporary Santa on my window. So they'd whittle me down. And I think I did a Santa at one point for $15. <laughs> I, spent, I think I spent like most of the day painting this nice Santa. And they're like, and here's your three fives. <laughs> Shit! So, so it, was, it, it was actually quite exciting at the time, even, even making very small amounts of money. It was exciting that people were actually uh, buying something from me. Um, and then a, another major turning point happened where I bumped into a guy named Dave McMillan, and he's a chef in Montreal, and he runs a restaurant called Joe Beef. And the guy, he's a very, he's a very physically a big man, but also very... His personality is a very imposing character. And I had no idea at the time that Joe Beef was a, a world famous restaurant. I had no idea who this guy was. So I strolled in to this restaurant because it was just the next door that I was bumping into. And I strolled in and said, Can I speak to the manager? Turns out he was in, in the restaurant at the time. He came out and I said, Oh, uh, would you like a. <laughs> would you like a fucking. <laughs> Would you, would you like a Santa? <laughs> and his response obviously was, get the fuck out of my restaurant, man. He's like, I, no, I don't want a Santa. So I'm on my way out the door, and then in his brain, it clicked that he, he wanted, for years he wanted, the kind of stuff I'm doing now, he wanted sort of hand lettering done, saying Joe Beef with the gold border and everything. So as I'm halfway out the door, he said, wait, do you know how to do sort of traditional lettering on glass? I was like, of course. <laughs> of course. I was like, that's what I do. I was, what, you think I only paint Santas? <laughs> un <laughs> un uh, unbeknownst to him, I had never done any traditional lettering. But at that point, you could have asked me to do anything, and I would have done it. So I, I said to him, yes, of course I can do that, but I'm very busy this week painting Santas. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to come back first thing next week. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no sweat. Come back next week. I wasn't busy, obviously, painting Santas. I needed the week to figure out how to actually do what he was asking me to do. So I spent the week doing that, sort of got to, found the, the right materials, found the stuff, the same type of paint I'm using now, found sort of the basic, the foundation of sign painting, and uh, practiced on a piece of glass at my house, ended up taking him the piece of glass, be like, this, I assume, is what you're speaking of? <laughs> and he, actually, at that point, he said, yeah, that is what I'm speaking of, but what, the, what are you doing? He's like, do you do like a demo like this for all your clients? I was like, yes, it helps the client to uh, visualize, <laughs> visualize exactly what is going to happen on your window. So I ended up going, doing it, painting it. It turned out really nice, and that was... Um, that was the switch. I never painted another Santa again. After that, another restaurant sort of saw what I had done there, and through the influence this restaurant had, it started spreading and spreading and spreading. I don't know if any of you have heard this quote. Um, Do what you can with what you have where you are. And this is a quote I heard quite recently, but it, as soon as I heard it, I thought that's exactly what I was up to during the Santa era where I was absolutely stuck. I had no prospects, no money. I'd quit my job, but I had some paint. I knew what Santa looked like. <laughs> and I just went out and started doing exactly that. Um, I had, I, some lady in interviewed me a year ago or so, and I told her the same thing I just told all of you about uh, the Joe Beef experience. And she said, Oh, the, Dave McMillan, he changed your destiny. And I said, uh, no, sort of, I guess. And she's like, no, it's true, he changed your destiny. If he had not asked you to paint a sign, you wouldn't be a sign painter right now. <laughs> I said, uh, 
I was like, kind, yeah, I guess, sort of. So I said, yeah, yeah, just, sure, he changed my destiny. But then, but then in retrospect, I was like, no, no, that was a, ni a very nice turning point. But the thing that really changed the destiny was doing what I could with what I had where I was. If I wasn't selling Santas, I never would have bumped into him at that moment to have that opportunity presented. So that one, as far as the, the hub of what we're talking about today, making money, that one is the strongest one that I can think of, that if you do what you can with what you have, where you are, it will hopefully lead to something. Nobody, none of us know what is actually out there behind all these doors, but if you go out and start knocking on them, weird, weird shit starts to happen. <laughs> So that one was a huge one. Um, the trick, the next trick uh, that I found was once the opportunity presents itself, you have to bite into that opportunity so strong and hold on to it like a rabid uh, muskrat. <laughs> Just, okay, I probably could have thought of a better animal. Um, but the, the idea of once it presents itself, biting in and holding on to it for dear life is an essential next uh, logical step. Um, for me, uh, sign-wise, um, it included the idea of biting into the opportunity that was presented to me uh, was three major, just three major things that, that en encompassed holding on to that opportunity, making sure that I made the most of that one chance to do a nice sign for one restaurant. First one was make sure the sign is absolutely fucking perfect. That was the huge, I spent like a week, I think I charged him $500 for the sign and spent a full working week executing the thing. And in the end, it didn't make me tons and tons of money, but it looked absolutely bang on. So that one, as far as personal advice goes, if you're doing anything, especially creatively, make sure that it's absolutely the best you can make it. Because if you do it half-assed, or if you do something, you say, ah, oh, that's good enough, people start to notice it, and the reputation goes to shit instantly. Like, ah, oh, he's, he's decent, but uh, it's a little bit shaky. Um, the second thing that I initially started doing when I started doing the sign stuff was not doing the same thing for anyone. So if client A gets this, you can't give the same thing to client B because everybody wants their own thing, especially creatively, that you can't give everybody the same, it's not, it's not just artistically. If you give everyone the same loaf of bread, everyone's like, okay, it's nice, it's good bread, but he's got that bread, I've got the bread. This girl down the street's got the bread. Everyone's got the same goddamn bread. <laughs> Especially with creative shit, that was a huge one for what I'm doing. Is, and it's time consuming as shit, because instead of having a system where you're like, yeah, yeah, I know how to do what I'm doing, every single client is a new project. You're like, shit, how do I twist what I'm doing again to, to suit this person specifically? And it goes on and on, but the time consuming aspect is hugely, hugely worth it. Giving everyone their own thing. Everybody wants to be special. And then the final one that I found is majorly essential if you're trying to sell anything to anyone. Um, if it makes them more money, it's a much easier sell and, an, and a much easier resell. That if you give them a product that ends up increasing their own business, it's almost you, that you don't even have to sell it anymore, that people keep coming back to you. They say, holy shit, this guy painted a sign. Um, people are talking about the sign. It makes my place look cool. The customer is more comfortable in the zone. There's people taking pictures of the thing, spreading it all around on Facebook, Instagram. It's sort of that if, if the product you give them increases their personal business, um, that's major, that you don't have to sell anything anymore. People keep coming back. So that's it. Quality, unique things, and make the client more money. A very lucky thing for me was the, um, the timing of when I actually started doing this, was it seems like these days there's a huge uh, 
so, sort of newfound, not newfound, but there's a, a huge appreciation these days for uh, craftsmanship, where people are starting to appreciate the fact that someone is good at a skill, whether it's sign painting is one, um, but you see it in the fashion world where people are drawn these days towards sort of, uh, say, say a shoe. S shoes, I'm, I'm noticing there's ads for sort of handmade shoes and in the ad there's an old shoemaker with his little hammer being like, old, old Joe made your shoe. And people these days are saying, oh, wicked, like, I love that old Joe made my shoe. <laughs> And I mean, it goes down the list. Food, the food world's doing the same, where it's not as fancy. People are serving shit in, in tin cans and sort of bringing it down to a more personal, a more uh, handmade, saying a human actually made this rather than a computer. And it's a, the timing for when I started painting signs was absolutely lucky as all hell that it was at a time when people were really starting to get drawn to this uh, sort of hand handmade revolution that seems to be happening. Um, people, <laughs> I've had the question, they're like, people say, oh, so do you want to be a sign painter when you're 70? And the answer is, hell no. <laughs> hell no. <laughs> Absolutely not. I've seen, I've seen a 70-year-old sign painter and <laughs> it is, it is not pretty. That is the best I can describe. It is not a pretty scene. I don't want to be a sign painter when I'm 70. But the, what I'm doing now is not only um, satisfying for me, but it's also sort of a, a personal advertising of things that I'm capable of, where it's sort of advertising the ability to paint, it's advertising the ability to uh, design, it's advertising all this stuff to a community that if I was just painting my own ideas on, on canvases and trying to hang them in galleries, I wouldn't be meeting the people that I'm meeting now. So I'm really, these days I'm looking at it as a very strong stepping stone for whatever the next step is. And I have no idea what the next step is, but I pray to Christ, I'm not a 70 year old sign painter. Um, the, design, the design aspect is the, the most exciting one these days where it's turned from, in the early days, recreating people's um, existing logos, typefaces, all this type of stuff, to now the portfolio is thick enough where people are saying, can you help me look more like this? So now it's getting into the world of um, branding and logo design and all this type of stuff. And that one is exciting as hell to me because it's a different, it's a completely different art form. It, obviously it's still using the design skills, but it's the art form of extracting uh, ideas from other people's brains, which is a really weird game to play, especially with people who are not creative people. That most people know generally what they want, but al also most people don't know how to explain that. Like the, the, the artistic or the creative language, which I had no idea how to describe this shit three years ago, but sometimes you bump into people who are like, I want <laughs> something that is like old, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Like I want it to look like old, but then they'll add in something like, but not like too old. <laughs> like I want it to have like a new, a newness to it, but I, I like totally old and blue. I want it to be blue. So you're like, what the fuck? What, I, what do you want? What are you talking about? So that one these days is becoming sort of an interesting new development in what I'm doing is the, the art form of calming people down saying, okay, old and new and blue, that's good. But what kind of stuff do you like? Like not just logos, but what, what are you into? Like what kind of movies do you like? What kind of clothing do you wear? What kind of, like just sort of the idea of trying to get inside other people's creative brains is becoming the sort of the next step even as we speak right now. So that's, a, that's an interesting one. And that's a, that's a hugely satisfying one too. Once you crack that code and hit the nail on the head and give someone the, the thing that was in their head is just one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. But also I don't get out that often. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
there's not uh, there's not much more to tell you. The the idea the uh, the end dream is eventually, uh, hopefully, in something related to what I'm doing, uh, possibly advertising. I don't know what the future holds, but the end dream is uh, run away, live in a log cabin, beside some body of water, and then paint paint stuff that's just in my head. Right now, I'm in um, the the commercial art world and it's combining ideas it's combining my ideas with the clients ideas and obviously any artistic person's dream is to just execute your own ideas and have people appreciate them uh, it takes a bloody long time to get there but that is the end dream of all this shit that I'm up to is naked on a lake <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's that's the dream naked on a lake that really is the end. Thank you. I am Dave Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, um, with, uh, with quality, uniqueness, and making the client money, does meeting that criteria um, stifle? Thank you. Does that, does that stifle the creativity? And I would say um, it stifles the personal creativity like it, it's not exactly nothing I'm doing sign wise almost nothing is exactly the way I would do it because it has the clients influence in it but on the other hand it sparks a different side of my creativity at least that it gets me out of my comfort zone that if you left me alone in a room just coming up with my own ideas, there is a pretty specific way I like things to look. And if I'm left to my own devices, most things look almost identical to the last thing. And it's the thing that's, it does stifle the personal creativity as far as getting your own emotions and your soul and all the stuff that's inside of you on the canvas. But it sparks a different type of creativity where you say, shit, I can't stick to the stuff I'm comfortable with. I can't stick to the the things I would naturally do, I need to step, it almost <laughs> s steps up the creativity, like I have to work with this other brain. And these days I'm creating stuff that if you had left me alone for the last three years, there's no possible way I would have done any of the stuff that I've done to, to date. That question was, uh, does bringing the client in <laughs> help, is that the question, yeah. help, help the collaboration? Yeah, sort of, sort of similar to what I was saying, that once you involve another brain, the whole thing changes. That instead of your own, your own natural instincts, your own likes and dislikes and everything coming out, it, those things still do come out, but then you're incorporating someone else's likes and dislikes into the thing. So it really is, all, all the sign stuff has to, to this point, almost all of it, is very collaborative. Um, and it, it starts to show that nothing, it, it helps actually on the idea of saying everyone gets something unique. If you start to work with other people almost naturally, it's going to be unique because you're combining your thoughts with this person, then your thoughts with this person, that the, the uniqueness starts to come the more you collaborate with, with the client. This, this question is more related to the process of sign painting, and unfortunately, those are my trade secrets. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm just joking. The, it's, it's a good question, the idea of working in different temperatures, working on different surfaces, working with different materials. Um, for me, it was all, um, it's almost all self-taught through the help of the internet, where I said, I've got a problem, this person wants something painted on a piece of glass what kind of paint do you use for that and found a, kind, a, a type of paint called One Shot which is this old, a hundred year old company that's been making sign painter paint and it's a thick, stinky enamel paint. So as soon as I found that I was like, okay, that's the shit you use to paint on glass. It doesn't rub off, it doesn't wash off, it's very heavy duty. Um, and then all the stuff that you're asking about, different temperatures, different materials, all that stuff, it's all the, the learning process that I went through of I'd show up to do a job in the winter and the heat coming off my hand would create condensation on the window that I was trying to paint and then you can't paint on a wet piece of glass. So all, that's one of a million 
bumps that I bumped into. I was like, what the fuck? I didn't even think of that. I was like, of course you can't paint on glass in the winter. So then you incorporate tricks of uh, using a, a stick, like all these old sign painters have a, it's called a mall stick that you, you can hold, like the, the stick is planted on the window over here and then you plant your hand on the stick up here so your hand is far enough from the window it's not heating up the window and then you have to learn how to paint with your hand on a stick. Like it's just all the, the, the whole, the whole bloody thing, same as anything, same as any skill that there's a bunch of shit you aren't expecting that you have to sort of adapt to as, as you're trying it. Um, there was some, I don't remember where it was, but some old sign guy at some point said that naturally sign painters are also inventors because of all the weird shit you bump into. You're like, oh my God, this isn't gonna work. I have to solve this in the next two hours or I'm not gonna pay my rent. What is a solution? And sometimes a solution is perfect Sometimes you run that solution for a couple months and realize you're wasting tons of time and come up with a new solution, but it's all, I could, I could bore the shit out of you telling me all the processes, but it's all invention. That's the, that's the trick. Start, same as what I was saying before, do what you can with what you have, where you are, and then if that doesn't work, twist it and twist it and twist it until it does work. There's a couple of old dudes uh, running around the city, but they are, they are the ultimate in traditional sign painters, where they've got their sort of three classic fonts, where one of them is a script, one of them is a sort of, ca it's called casual, where it's sort of like a, a italics almost, and one is just straight block letters. And they do beautiful work. They're, they're a million times better with a brush than I am, where they aren't using stencils, they aren't using anything. They'll just show up and say, what's the name of your clothing store? And <laughs> It's beautiful, it's absolutely perfect and beautiful, but everybody's getting a similar thing. Everyone's getting, like the, the, the color of paint will change, the layout will change, certain things will change, but everyone has a similar vibe to it. Whether it's the bakery, the clothing store, the restaurant, the laundromat, you can tell that it's all the same guy who's done it. And I think it's what's helped me <coughs> get to where I am currently is that people are, I think, starting to realize that if they ask me to do something, I'm not going to give them what the last guy got, and they're, they're not going to get what the next guy's going to get. Everyone's getting something a little personal, personal twist. So the, the sign painter scene is not present. It's not big. I, I, met, I met this. This is the 70-year-old sign painter. I watched him for a day, and it, it was incredible. It was actually unbelievable what he was able to do with a brush and how quickly he was able to do it. But uh, he's the only other sign painter I know in Montreal. And I saw him once. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, actually, that's the sad, the sad twist is, sign painting is so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to add that and I forgot to mention that in the original speech. <laughs> this young lady's asking about if you give everyone something unique, do you lose your own your own brand, essentially. Um, I think it's a difference, especially artistically, I think it's a difference between um, commercial art and your own art. If you're doing your own art projects, you want your style, you want your look, you want your thing. But if you're doing commercial art, at least in my brain, it's, it's the absolute opposite, where you don't want to give everybody your thing, you want to provide them with their thing. And that now, at this point, for me, that has become part of my brand, is that it doesn't look the same. Not everything looks alike, but that is the brand, is that not everything looks alike, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this question was related to um, the, the, the pricing. If you do it hourly and then you go over what you estimated hourly, do you still charge the same price or do you ding the client triple because it took three <laughs> times as long? Um, it's sort of a it's sort of a sliding scale that if it's if it's if you have fucked the, the quote up so badly that you spend three weeks on a project that you thought was going to take three days, you have to just for your own survival you have to go back to the client in a, a huge blanket of shame and say I really messed up like I thought this was going to cost you two hundred I can't charge you two hundred for this this took me three weeks I need yeah. to step this up but I do that 
as rarely as possible. That if, if I give someone a quote, I try to base it just loosely on not, not an actual hourly, but on a, um, just a, an idea of if it's going to take me this much time and my bills are this much money, is this <laughs> profitable for me? Um, usually I can get it pretty close and oftentimes I'll go over time-wise what I originally expected but just in the interest of my own reputation and my own integrity it's the final product. yeah it's a shameful thing if any if any of my clients <laughs> see this video they'll say I'm one of those clients that he gave me a requote this fucking asshole <laughs> But I try, I actually try to do that as rarely as possible. If you give someone a quote, that's an important one. Try as hard as you can to make it a, an accurate quote because nobody likes getting a requote. This is the question, am I still eating hot dogs and cheese for every meal? Um, I am not actually in three years. The first year of sign painting was still quite nightmarish that the idea of not having a portfolio, not having any contacts. Uh, the first year was very, very, rough financially. The second year was noticeably better. Um, last year was noticeably better than the second year. And I'm not, I, I should level with all of you, I'm not actually driving a car that's a gold bar. <laughs> but I'm also not eating hot dogs and cheese sandwiches every single meal. So yeah, now, I mean, just actually just recently I was telling Sharif uh, last night that uh, in October, my girlfriend and I finally got a place together, and it's the first time in eight years since moving to Montreal that my clothes are not hanging right beside my desk. So that was a huge step up. The, the, the fact I have a house and a workshop, well, what more could you ask for? <laughs> this question was, it, does it, uh, did it take a while to learn how to run my business financially? And very honestly, I'm still learning how to do that. I've, I've got a naturally artistic brain and the idea of wrangling the business brain is a job in itself. Um, it's a, technically the business side is not terribly complicated, at least the way I'm doing it, that I keep track of the money I've spent on anything that's related to business, keep receipts, um, keep track of all the money that's coming in, keep an envelope full of invoices. And then at the end of the year, I give all of it to the tax guy and say, how much money did I make? Um, the, anyone I talk to financially is like, okay, that's good. That's, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's cool, but you know you can do a lot more stuff. Like, that's the, like, the caveman version of business. And right now, that is exactly how I like it, where I'm like, I don't want to get complicated. I don't want to do anything tricky. I don't want to start pulling any sneaky moves to cut tax. I was like, just I'm making enough to pay my rent and buy some groceries. And at this point, I'm definitely not, you wouldn't want to hire me to run your books. <laughs> but uh, it's a, it's a same, as the, same as the actual painting itself. It's an ever-growing skill that every, every month you learn something, something new. Thank you.